Welcome back, fans, stands, and I guess hopefully there's ladies watching the show too. We like everybody. We're back with another episode of the main film for Bunk Bed Breakdowns, and we're going to go through our regular stuff, probably cover a lot of the games, some more sadness for Noah after watching his team get Raffle Bro, I'm so happy by, right now. What are you talking about? Raffle stomped by my Patriots, just, just straight up embarrassed, embarrassed, just, just sad. You just hate to see it, but uh, I'm sure Noah shed some tears this weekend. No chance. Um, I've never felt better, actually, than Mike. I, I'm rejuvenated. 45 nothing. That's kind of impressive. When was, it 38? was it 38 or 45? It was 45. They held 4-5, oh, sure. like change for a 20. Shout out J. Cole. It was, <laughs> it was disgusting. I, actually, we'll get to it later, but it, it's not going to be like last week. I, I've overcome my emotions. I've, I've moved <laughs> past it. This team, is, it, they mean nothing to me. Yeah. It's, uh, look, man, it, it's week 13. So that was the last week of the, of the regular season. So congratulations to those of you who are lucky enough to make it to the playoffs did you make it to the playoffs in the home league you auto drafted well we're recording this on tuesday night and i need dalton schultz to score less than one point to make okay. it into the playoffs. so i'm not gonna look at the score at all mike you better not tell me what happens in this game when this recording is over i'm not gonna watch the game and holy I'm shit lamar just broke one who lamar just broke a touchdown fourth and okay, two rush ran it in i don't want to hear anything else about this game because this the home league isn't great. It was it was an auto draft. I was MIA when the draft was going on. Everything was a shit show. I made like a million trades. My team ended up being good, but then this week everybody stunk, which we'll talk about right after we hit the intro. So look. Like, let's talk about some of the games. We don't want to go through every single one because, like every week, a lot of them are just not very good. Don't want to talk about it. But let's talk a little bit about the Saints game. First of all, how bad is Matt Ryan? Like, I'm telling you right now, this when you think of the Titans and the Vikings, do you just think of like good defenses? Like, uh, even though they stink, but like you just think they're good defenses because they're the Titans and the Vikings. I mean, I know that their defense isn't that good, so I don't think about that. But I think for the general populace, like, that's probably what they think of, like, Mike Zimmer. I just think, like, when I think Vikings and Titans, I'm like, wow, they're hard nose off defenses. They're going to run the ball. Not true. When I think of the Falcons, I think of a team that is a great offense and a terrible defense. Over these past few weeks, that is completely changed. Their defense is really stepping up. I know they played Taysom Hill, and I know that offense on the same side of the ball, all they care about is really killing the clock right now. But the Falcons did pretty well defensively and offensively. Matt Ryan is – he's a problem. He is not good. The whole – everybody was saying, oh, Julio Jones, when he's out, he's not good. Turns out when Julio Jones is in, he's not good. When Hayden Hurst is there, he's not good. When Calvin Ridley's there, he's not good. This whole team is – it's an enigma. I mean, they have so many weapons, yet they run a three-headed monster of Edo Smith, Brian Hill, and Todd Gurley, who have, like, two knees combined. Young Hoku might be the most valuable player in the NFL, who the Chargers cut in favor of Michael Badgley, who can't make a kick. So I'm real happy about that. This team is – they're terrible. Matt Ryan has looked terrible. He's a little bit older. I'm worried about him in terms of dynasty because I think he's a free agent after this year. There's talk of Shanahan maybe bringing him in. I don't know. He just hasn't looked great. He hasn't thrown back-to-back. He hasn't had back-to-back weeks with multiple touchdowns since week one and week two. whole lot of zeros, whole lot of ones he's throwing up there. It's, it's not looking good in Atlanta, and it's kind of sad because the team is finally like shaping into being an actually good real-life team. But as with the Chargers, some teams just will find a way to turn their identity into their weakness and then thus become a shit team again. And that's what the Falcons are right now. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the sad part is, like, normally Matt Ryan is really, really bad without Julio Jones. But he had Julio Jones and he had Kelvin Ridley. Uh, just really no excuse pass from They didn't 50%. have him. That's what it came down they to. They did not have him. Todd Gurley. Man, I can think back to a few weeks ago uh, when, like, I tweeted about how Todd Gurley's wash and people got big mad talking about how he, like, scored touchdowns. Look, this is what you get when Todd Gurley doesn't score a touchdown. You get five points. This eight carries for 16 yards. Like, this is what Todd Gurley is now, and if you start him, this is what you can expect as a floor. His floor is basically basement level. Um, if you didn't trade away Todd Gurley, you're probably fucked. Like, you're not going to get anything for him now. Um, but yeah, you just, you just can't feel comfortable starting him in any sort of like negative game script, but I guess more interesting on the other side of the ball, Alvin Kamara had a little bit of life, still only two targets, uh, sorry, two receptions for nine yards. Not great. And also Taysom Hills vulturing a lot of stuff on the ground. Like he's, what is he averaging? Like he's basically like 
first year Lamar Jackson <laughs> now, just like in terms of like I put out a how tweet. much I don't know has. if it's like too brash or ignorant to say, but I think next year, if Taysom Hill's the starter in New Orleans and they have Michael Thomas, they have Alvin Kamara, I think it's a toss up between the two. I know he's not like the best pass in the no, world, man. Dude, I'm telling you, what has Lamar no. Jackson done? I know he just broke a touchdown, according to you, but like, what has Lamar Jackson done this year to show any sort of like confidence in him? Like, he hasn't been a quarterback one this year. He can run the ball. They don't have that many weapons that they use consistently. Whereas Taysom Hill, like, sure, he's not the best passer of the ball, but he's putting up, what, like 60, 70, 80 rushing yards a week, getting touchdowns on the ground. And, you know, he, he used to be a quarterback, maybe a full offseason of preparation. Obviously, Sean Payton trusts him more than Taysom, uh, than James Winston. I don't know. I think it's a discussion that has to be had. Obviously, Dynasty, you take Lamar Jackson because he's not 31 years old and from BYU or whatever. But I don't know. He's, he, hasn't looked, he hasn't looked great in real life, but in terms of fantasy, he's been a quarterback one basically every week. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm fine if you want to, like, roll him out there for a redraft, but I'm not putting him out there for, like, a season long. I mean, it's hard to trust him for a season. Having said that, like, I guess Tim Tebow was a QB1 for, like, a season, but that's honestly what, what Taysom Hill is in my eyes. He is a – he's just another Tim Tebow, maybe slightly better passer. I can't even say a that. A little more sexy. Um, yeah, Lamar Jackson obviously isn't, isn't a great passer, um, but, like, what gives me hope is he actually, like, played some real quarterback in college and he actually improved throughout his college career so you can kind of see that um progression and i would still much 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 prefer lamar jackson i think the one issue with lamar jackson is uh like greg roman and his offense has not evolved at all it's kind of like with kaepernick you know like once you figure him out he doesn't like change at all which is probably why he has no like head coaching gigs because the guy doesn't really invent stuff so hopefully they kind of figure that out but that's like a that's a that's another discussion but i guess michael thomas man uh you know another nine receptions 105 yards no touchdowns yet but you know those are those are pretty random but he is you know by all means back to that target hog uh volume hog that he had he was prior to getting hurt so that is something that you like to see um you like him or keenan allen more in dynasty i still like michael thomas um, I, I know you put out the tweet about keenan allen it's it's a fair one to be honest but uh i do think like we were seeing a little bit of the dip in keenan allen's volume with eckler coming back and that was something that like i was a little bit concerned about Keenan Allen's still going to ball because he's Keenan Allen. Uh, I'm not that worried. But I think just like Michael Thomas has been historically one of the most top-end elite producers of all time um, in the NFL, what he's been able to do. And so I would just rather bet on that. And we kind of showed like what it looked like with Ted, Teddy Bridgewater as well. Now Taysom Hill isn't as good of a passer as Teddy Bridgewater. But I think Michael Thomas is QB proof. I, I'm kind of in the camp where like I think the wide receiver talent outweighs the, uh, the QB. Uh, mm-hmm. both are important obviously you want both but i think the wide receiver matters a bit more and i think you know as good as keenan allen is i think michael thomas is the better wide receiver so personally i'd rather have michael thomas but uh you know if you want to go keenan allen I, yeah I see oh, i'm definitely going keenan allen i think there's um they're one spot apart for me it's not too big of a deal i only tweeted out shout out scott he traded like michael thomas for keenan allen or something like that and i was thinking about it i'm like this was before last week so obviously michael thomas had a hundred yard game with Taysom hill i'm like well justin herbert is objectively the best quarterback in the league uh keenan <laughs> allen and Back michael thomas are they they both have floors of like 1300 yards obviously michael thomas is a higher ceiling but they're one year apart one of them has a quarterback that we know is going to be around for a while that's that was my argument but i get it i mean michael thomas has shown with three different quarterbacks he can produce he's obviously really good at running slant routes all the power to him but uh if he's just gonna keep putting up 100 yards and double digit, double digit uh targets every single week it's hard to keep him outside of the t- uh wide receiver one conversation but that's exactly what I'm going to do because I think he's my wide receiver 13 right now in Dynasty. Wow. Just we've wide seen so 13. many young guys. I have Stephon Diggs ahead of him. I have obviously Justin Jefferson, CeeDee Lamb, Amari Cooper. It's just this, it's such a deep position that wide receiver 13 sounds disrespectful. But when you look at the guys ahead of him, it's like, I get it. He's just there because there's so many other names. No, for sure. I mean, it is hella deep. So, you know, honestly, it's like I have like the tier one group of guys, which is like five guys. Um, and then I have I have Michael Thomas still as like a top eight wide receiver, but uh, I totally understand because like you can kind of swap back and forth between those mm-hmm. guys. Um, but yeah, let's move on from uh, the running back at quarterback, and let's let's hit the Browns for a sec. Baker Mayfield revenge game. He went out there, I think he threw like four tutties in like the first half. Um, he's throwing it every which way to you know Rashard Higgins had himself a day. Even freaking Donovan People Jones had himself. Has Rashard a day. Higgins broken out one game like every year for the past five years. Like every <laughs> yeah. single year, it's like pick this guy up and he does nothing the rest. Yeah, of Yeah, he's broken out a couple of times. Um, but yeah, I mean Nick Chubb continues to do Nick Chubb things. You know, eighty yards. He actually got a lot of work through the air. Um, I remember having this discussion earlier on the air where like 
you know, someone said that Kareem Hunt without Nick Chubb is better than Nick Chubb without Kareem Hunt. I think we've answered that question. Nick Chubb's one of the best running backs in the league, and he is absolutely elite. So if you have him, ride him. you got great playoffs schedule coming on. What do, what do you think about Baker Mayfield? Is this, is this one game enough to kind of flip the script for you and, and like, buy back in to his young, talented, uh, young, young, talented guy and his, his bravado and his swagger? Or are you kind of still, like, you know what, Mike? Him? I think I found the issue. Baker Mayfield has small hands, and every time he plays in Cleveland, it's windy. What do you think is going to happen? He's played in Cleveland like the past four or five weeks. It seems like every week it's a home game, and he fucking stinks. He goes to Tennessee, and he drops four touchdowns like it's his job and like 40 points in the blink of an eye. I'm not saying I'm backing on Baker Mayfield. I'm not saying I'm going to trade him for Kyler Murray and redo history. I'm just saying maybe maybe there's a little bit more than meets the eye. Maybe when it gets a little windy, when it gets a little shysty in that, in that Cleveland weather, Baker Mayfield can't be trusted, but – uh, as far as like dynasty value, I'm not going to move him up too much because of this one game. Obviously, like dynasty is a long haul and people are very reactionary. You still got to realize Kareem Hunt is there for now. Nick Chubb, hopefully he comes back. This is still going to be a team that wants to run the ball a lot. And for as good as Austin Hooper may think he is, or for as good as Jarvis Landry has looked, and maybe Odell when he's back will be good again. This just looks like a run heavy team that's relying on a young up and coming defense. I don't see the volume being all too much all there, like there throughout the rest of his career, really. And He's going to have to be super efficient for him, like a Ryan Tannehill, be super efficient for him to return quarterback one value. He doesn't run a whole lot. So this one big performance in a game where probably like 2% of people who roster him actually started him, unless it's a super flex league. And even then you probably weren't starting him. I mean, this was just like a Darius Slayton play where like he goes off and nobody started him. Then you think he's good and he puts up seven straight duds. That's what we saw at a Baker Mayfield here. I'm not sure if you feel the same way, but to me, this seems like the Baker Mayfield trap that we experienced early in his career as well. Yeah, I think, you know, I think Baker, I'm not a huge fan, uh, but I will say, I think, you know, if you're, if you're trying to take a shot on a young guy and pay like a late first for him, like I'm not, I'm not, I would not be opposed to that in a super flex league. Uh, he is still. Where do you think he ranks player. among the 2021 class in quarterbacks? Do you think he'd be third for you? Uh, he's definitely after Fields. He's definitely after T-Law. Obviously, it's so hard with like not yeah, knowing the landing not spots. Knowing the landing Baker spots. Mayfield is as average a landing spot as you could think. Like the Browns are just dead, yeah. dead middle of the pack. Yeah, but I do think he's like a middling to back end like QB two, right? So that's like kind of valuable in, in super flex leagues. And he is still young. Like you don't know what's going to happen down the road. And we have seen the height of Baker Mayfield, and it is quite good. Well, he's he not very tall, but yeah, I know. What you're <laughs> yeah, if he gets back to that, it could be could be quite lucrative like who would you rather have uh baker mayfield or like jared goff i think i'd rather have goff i just the weapons there and you know they do like to run a lot but it seems like after the bye every single year you can just fire up goff as like a quarterback one because they just decide to throw the ball after week nine <laughs> yeah. uh i also think like the coaching there is more favorable for him i know stefanski's been pretty good this year but sean McVay is obviously like that whole man child man genius whatever he is it's very close though because they're there's super similar if they don't do yeah. it with their arm they don't do it on the ground so you have to rely on them throwing yeah. either a whole bunch of yards or a whole bunch of touchdowns and uh yeah I, i'd just rather have golf i think they're both around like quarterback 15 16 for me yeah yeah I, i think those i think that's like a really really good like uh comparison right because i think they're both guys that can like get it done under the right circumstances with the right weapons um, but both will like, you can't really put the game on their shoulders, right? If you put the game on golf shoulders, you're just going to lose. If you put the game on Baker Mayfield shoulders, you're just going to lose. Uh, and that's kind of what, and that's fine, right? Cause not every quarterback's elite. And I think, you know, they're both starting caliber quarterbacks on the flip side of the ball. Speaking of starting caliber quarterbacks, Ryan Tannehill, uh, you know, mostly a lot of garbage time production, obviously, cause he got raffle stomped for the first half. But, you know, Tannehill did his thing, man. Just still a really, really solid uh, fantasy quarterback. Oh, I know, Mike. I played against him in my home league. That's the only reason why <laughs> this game is close right now. The guy threw, like, two touchdowns with two seconds left in the game. Corey Johnson <laughs> all of a sudden just sprung out of nowhere and caught, like, a toe-tap touchdown. Never heard of the guy. He murdered me. So, I, we have a little bit of vendetta going on. But I want to talk about Corey Davis. Yeah. Unbelievable. At the end of last season, I traded a second-round pick, a second-round rookie pick. I think it ended up being 210 for him. And the guy right after a trade, he's like, wow, I can't believe you gave me that. That's awful. I said, just you wait for the next Devontae Parker to break the fuck out. I also traded for Corey Coleman last year. So one of the Corey's helped me out. Corey is in the house and he's helping me right now. But he's he's been great this year. He put up a donut a few weeks back. And I think mm-hmm. it was a Chicago or Indianapolis game. One of the two. Despite the donut, his season-long average, he's I know he's missed a few games. Dealing with COVID, he's averaging five 
6.3 receptions, 80.1 receiving yards, and uh, 0.6 touchdowns, so about half a touchdown per game for a full season-long pace of 85 for over 1,280 yards and six touchdowns. Those are legitimate high-end wide receiver two numbers. Obviously, he won't reach that peak because he did miss a few games. But on a per-game basis, I think I saw you tweeted out, what is he, like wide receiver, like 13 or something? 17, wide receiver 17 ahead of Mike Evans, ahead of Chris Godwin, ahead of Cooper Cup, um, ahead of a bunch of guys. Yeah, and he's just – he looks good too. He's looking the part of his old self in college. He was picked number five overall, one ahead of Mike Williams, who's fucking terrible. But he's <laughs> – He's looking good out there, and somebody tweeted at me. It's like, oh, didn't you realize what they said in the offseason? Nobody wanted to believe them. Vrabel was saying he's their best receiver, and that's obviously not true because A.J. Brown <laughs> yeah. is an absolute animal. But Corey Davis is creating the conversation that it's more of a 1A, 1B situation than a 1-2 because on a per-game basis, other than touchdowns, Corey Davis is outproducing him in every single facet of the game. He's averaging more targets, more receptions, more receiving yards. And he is turning more into a like a do it all type of receiver. He's not just down the field trying to moss people. He's good after the catch. He's winning contested situations. I know they didn't pick up his fifth year option, so he's gonna make himself some money this offseason as an unrestricted free agent. If he goes back there, I'd love it. If he doesn't, he finds himself in like a Green Bay or something else like that, like a team that wants to use him. Obviously, Devontae Adams would be the one, but a team that wants to give him 100 to 120 targets a season, I think he can be a high end wide receiver three, low end wide receiver two, and for dynasty. I was looking at my rankings, and it's a he's a bit lower just because I have guys like – obviously, Brandon Ayuk rose up after this week. But um, I think I have a wide receiver 40, but he can like reasonably be within your top 30, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't laugh at that at all. I mean, this guy has the pedigree of it. And on, although it took a while to break out, we got to realize in his second year in the league with – I think Marcus Mariota and Delaney Walker was taking away targets. What do you have, like almost 900 yards, like five, six touchdowns? Then they went through a quarterback change, and they brought in A.J. Brown his third year. So it's it's been up and down. He hasn't had the best quarterback play, and now that he does have it, and now that he does have chemistry with Tannehill, he's showing exactly what we thought he would be. That's just a talented X receiver. Yeah, yeah. It's been, it's been quite impressive. I will say, man, the one change that we'll note now is, like, he moved from being the number one last, e- last season – uh, first half of last season to now being like the number two where like Adrian Brown kind of like takes on that alpha role. And that, that is always a, like, I feel like it's an underappreciated change uh, for people. Like that's why I'm, I'm all, I'm, I'm really impressed by someone like Justin Jefferson who kind of walked into the one, a role right away and started producing same with T Higgins. That's really, really hard to do. Like Michael Thomas is like really the only one, uh, not the only one, but one of the main ones I can think back to uh, in recent memory who basically transitioned from like the one B to one A seamlessly and like, like never lost a step. Right. So you're kind of seeing Corey Davis go back to that. If he lands in another situation, like, like you said, if he lands in the Packers and he gets to serve that wide receiver two role, because we know he's better than freaking Marquez Valdez, uh, shitling, whatever the fuck his name is. And MBS, drop yeah, city. yeah. I'm VS. He's but drop city. He's better than him. Um, that would be a good role. Like if he's in that How about second, Houston? second he'd, he'd still probably be the one a there if Fuller is gone, but I think him and cooks have a good dichotomy of talent that it could work out with Watson. Yeah. Houston, Houston could be a good one. I mean, I think, you know, even jets could be a good one. Um, I guess. And then, today, yeah. yeah. I think, you know, th- there's a couple of good spots for him. I think he's going to earn some money, but yeah, I don't, I don't think he's, he's like ready to kind of take that alpha role, which is, you know, I love Corey Davis when he's coming out of college. Like, I love that, like, big-bodied guy that can kind of, like, get yak and he just never translated. So, glad to see that it's kind of working out for him right now. Uh, but, yeah, that's a good good game. Good Corey Davis explosion week to kind of put himself back on the map, hopefully earn himself in dollars. Bears, Lions, Bears find a way to lose. Uh, yeah. Matthew Stafford went ham, 400 yards. Um, DeAndre Swift was obviously injured. So, in steps Ty Johnson. Um, no, wrong team. Ty Johnson sorry, plays for the Sorry, Jets. not Ty Johnson. In, in steps Adrian Peterson um, and went back to his old ways of averaging like three yards per carry, but fell in there for a couple of touchdowns. Marvin Jones, I actually started him in a bunch of leagues. Good to see him get that revival. I think the, the one really, really bright spot outside DeAndre Swift this entire offense is my horse, my one horse, TJ Hawkinson. Currently the tight end. Uh, tight end three behind Darren Waller and George Kittle, the tight end four on a point per game basis. Uh, if you add Kittle in there, but you know, in his second year, having a pretty, pretty damn good breakout, and he it puts him in really, really good company in terms of what he's been able to do so far. So, if you are in dynasty leagues, you should be, I mean, you should have acquired him already, but if you aren't, like, pay, pay for him, pay for him because this is like where the future is going to be from the tight end position. What he's been able to do, even though it's not like weak winning status and like Travis Kelsey and like Darren Waller, stuff like that. This is like the progression you want to see for young tight ends in dynasty. 
Yeah, I'm just – this team, they scare me so much. How is DeAndre Swift suffering concussions midweek? And then it comes out, oh, he doesn't have a concussion anymore, but now he has a brain injury or brain illness? Like, I don't know. That doesn't sound good to me. Yeah, that did Kenny not Kenny Galladay had a hip injury that they could have put him on the IR for. He's still not in the IR, and he's about to miss, what, his fifth game? This, <laughs> yeah. Whatever's going on here, like, I pray New- for these guys. They're in Washington. Whoever just – I don't know. I don't want to talk about this team. They're a fucking mess. Chicago's yeah. a mess. Chicago blew a massive lead. Allen Robinson is – he's all right. I mean, I mean, he's great, but the quarterback play just makes him all right. Dave Montgomery will do whatever it takes to convince people at the end of every season that he's going to be a top 12 running back the next year because he puts up massive stats at the end of the season. Cool. He's the RB11 this season. What was he from weeks 1 to 12? I don't know. Probably the running back 29. He just does <laughs> – the entire year breaks out the end of the year we all knew his schedule was going to end up doing this for him and I do think he's a decent enough running back that if the schedule is there he's going to produce because you know he's not going to break away big plays I think he did have a pretty long touchdown run I'm um, I think Green Bay he had like a 57 yard run but he's not going to have breakaway touchdown runs he's not going to be huge in the receiving game in terms of breaking away uh big plays but you know he's getting four or five catches a game he's getting 20 carries obviously you're going to produce when Tariq Cohen is back because they just paid him all that money and they have a different quarterback under center. Who knows what Dave Montgomery is? I think it's a false sense of hope that we're just going to go right back to the Dave Montgomery train next season. And guess what? We're going to be disappointed for the worst first 12 weeks again. And then maybe they have their divisional games against the Lions, Green Bay Packers, and Minnesota, who none of them can stop the run at the end of the season. And it's just a never-ending cycle of us keep chasing Dave Montgomery. And we'll probably catch up to him because he's real slow. But he's... I don't know. He's, he's an enigma. Um, actually, he's not really an enigma. We know exactly what he is. So Chicago, I, I, I don't know what's going to go on. Hopefully they get a quarterback. Mitchell Trubisky is not the answer. Nick Foles is not the answer. But, I mean, they just fucking added 13 tight ends in the offseason. They decided to pick up Nick Foles' contract. So who knows what's going on in Chicago? I, I wouldn't be surprised if both those guys are back next year somehow. Yeah, I mean, Trubisky, uh, Trubisky, not a great passer, but he's actually pretty good for David Montgomery. I mean, you kind of see a lot of the running lanes kind of open up having that mobile quarterback. Uh, Dave, look, David Montgomery, you're just going to start him, man. You're going to start him, and you're going to recognize that, like, this is not norm. And, you know, in any week, he can give you, like, 8 to 10 points, and that's fine because he's getting the volume. He's good volume play, good RB2 play. I'm hoping to ride him. I hope he blows up. I hope he can do blows up so I can ride him in the championship. Um, but, I, like, don't go out there, like, paying, like, mid-round first for him because I don't I don't know if that's the right play. Oh, uh, Just a lot of uncertainty there with, you know, Tariq Cohen being out and all that stuff. So, yeah, just just enjoy it. I think in redraft, enjoy him in dynasty. Um, you know, if you can kind of trade him, if you're not contending, um, you can kind of trade him for like a mid round first. Like that would be that would be an ideal return, right? Because then you can take a swing on, you know, like a Najee Harris or one of the top wide receivers, or uh, even like Javante Williams or someone in that. And the caliber. beautiful thing about that too is like if Dave Montgomery ends up shitting the bed the rest of the season his value is going to plummet because we all know what the schedule is. That yeah. mid-round first is only going to rise from here. So it's a good trade-off if you're not competing right now. Yeah, exactly. Um, next game, I think we can just skip the Dolphins-Bengals game. Really nothing to talk about there. Tua came back, did his thing. I mean, nothing to talk about in the Bengals at all. Um, yeah, really not much nothing. Not much there at all. Other than, really like, nothing. I'm pretty sure the Dolphins are like, maybe we should have taken Justin <laughs> Herbert. But we'll leave yeah. that for another day. I've heard enough slander of Justin Herbert to yeah. – yeah. Um, Jaguars, Vikings. I mean, James Robinson, don't need to talk about him that much anymore. He's basically a top five running back. Um, been a stud throughout, getting a lot of targets, getting a lot of workload. Uh, LaVisca Chanel came back, but then he got injured again, which is like mm-hmm. not he really. touchdown like bounced off a guy's helmet. It was just, yeah, it's LaVisca Chanel. Just crazy things happen every week. With yeah. Him. But on the flip side of the ball, Kirk Cousins, man, continues the ball. I've been a big fan of him since the offseason. And, you know, he continues to do his thing, but gets disrespected. Like, just a great QB2 in super flex formats, in my opinion. Like, super cheap. If you're a contender, you know, you should grab him and, and ride him because, like, he's actually signed through throughout. And, you know, recognize that he's being limited by his coach. Like, Mike Zimmer is not a pass-friendly head coach. Neither is Gary Kubiak as a play caller. So, if that ever changes because the Vikings have kind of been underwhelming, you know, you can kind of see that upside of what Cousins used to be. Like, literally, like – you know, 5,000 yard passer, 4,800 yard passers in the realm of possibilities. Um, that's why I really love him, right? And Dalvin Cook does Dalvin Cook things 32 carries and six receptions. He had 38 touches this game. He had like 41 opportunities. He had just, a crazy just, amount of targets, too. Just insane. Just like a top, top end running back. Like when he's healthy, like you can put him in the same tier as Christian McCaffrey. But, you know, let's talk about Justin Jefferson. Where do you have him in your dynasty? Because he is, he is hot and there's a, it's been a hot topic of debate. Uh, so far this this week, I've seen a lot of people with like Justin Jefferson, Dynasty wide receiver one talk. I think it's a it's a valid discussion. Um, I have him in my top five. My top five is just the same tier of guys. I really don't like 
doing specific ranks. So uh, from that perspective, uh, I think he definitely warrants discussion. But where where do you have Justin Jefferson, uh, he is, both as a I'm, rookie and as the dynasty wide receiver ranking? Uh, well, rookie, he's number one wide receiver. Do you mm-hmm. mean like rookie overall? Yeah. Well, I would take Herbert and Burrow ahead of him. And mm-hmm. Gibson's close. I really have Gibson like – He's higher than every other guy, him, him and Swift. So I'd probably take those four, but it's really close there. I don't know. I'd, I'd rather have him than Justin or than Jonathan Taylor. I just feel like it's so safe because what Justin Jefferson is doing, like this guy didn't have a big role in this offense until week three. And from there on out, the guy's averaging almost six catches a game, almost 97 yards a game and more than half a touchdown a game. He has been absolutely incredible. As far as overall dynasty, I think we probably have the same top five, maybe a different order, but it's a tier. So it's, DK Metcalf, Devonte Adams, Tyreek, and AJ Brown, and then mm-hmm. also Justin Jefferson. I just moved him to my number five spot. He jumped CD Lamb for me because yep. you look at what's going on here and compared to what CD Lamb was doing in Dallas. CD Lamb was having a fantastic rookie season, but he his heights were nowhere near Justin Jefferson's heights right now. And mm-hmm. a lot can change with Dallas. Maybe they fired Mike McCarthy because he's an absolute fraud and they don't throw as much. Um, uh, there's a few other things like Blake Jarwood coming back. I'm not convinced that he's good, but maybe that hurts him a little bit. As far as Justin Jefferson goes, we have seen this Minnesota Vikings offense, despite being a run heavy approach mm-hmm. and having a consolidated target share produce two top 12 or top fringy top 12 receivers in digs and Thielen before. And what Jefferson is doing right now is nothing short of spectacular. I'm pretty sure he's on pace for the most rookie receiving yards ever. And the fact he's that not, he, he's like uh, the number two, uh, number two on like through through this many weeks, number two like most yards ever. It's ridiculous. And you look at what he is. And I was thinking about like the the things I value most in a fantasy receiver, other than just like them putting up points, but like real life stuff, like route running. I know the guy can get open. He's a great route runner. Is he versatile? Can he move inside outside? That's exactly what he did at LSU. That's what he did throughout this season. Uh, this season, he played inside. Now he's on the outside. He's dominating. He wins in contested catches. He wins deep down the field. He's good after with the ball in his hands, yards after the catch. He's basically just like a lighter A.J. Brown, and he is seeing more volume than A.J. Brown. Now, A.J. Brown has done it for two straight seasons, so I have a little bit more confidence, not saying I lack any sort of confidence in Justin Jefferson, but I would put him a little bit behind A.J. Brown. And people are saying, oh, there's one guy in particular, I'm pretty sure it's like, oh, you guys would have ranked Justin Jefferson ahead of A.J. Brown last year because he did it. He's doing what he's doing right now, but now we see what A.J. Brown has become. I'm not sure if that made sense, but basically saying, like, hold your horses on Justin Jefferson. Why? There's, like, nothing out of the ordinary happening in Minnesota to make Justin Jefferson produce more than he probably should be. He's producing at an elite level without any confounding variables happening. Like, Dalvin Cook hasn't been out for an extended time. Uh, Adam Thielen hasn't missed an extended time, missed a few games with COVID. But they have a full slate of weapons, a full arsenal of weapons, and he's doing what he's doing on an offense that's not throwing a whole bunch. To me, there's no reason why he should be outside your top 10. And honestly, like top five, I think, is basically yep. a lock for a guy at his age and his production. Yeah, listen up, boomers. Uh, those of you who are unwilling to move someone like Justin Jefferson to your top five or because he's a because he's a rookie or whatever. This, like I've talked about this before, but young producing wide receivers are the safest bet you can make in Dynasty outside of – rookie first round picks right like when someone produces this early chance of them busting later on down the road is extremely low so unless you're saying and your feet are made of like glass yeah yeah confidently move him into that top five and if you want to move him to your number one i will have no arguments i mean i have arguments because i think it's higher kill but i will not shade you like do not be afraid to go early and jump the gun and buy and pay up for someone like justin Jefferson. go out there and throw out two first round picks from right now go out there and throw out a first round pick plus uh, you know, another wide receiver because that, that is a protected asset barring catastrophic career ending injury. I'm very confident in Justin Jefferson and what he's able to do as a wide receiver. And at the same, and the most impressive thing to me, like I said, is the fact that he came on, stepped on and became the X receiver immediately. Like that is a incredibly hard thing to do. Just transition from college DBs who barely press and cover you to NFL cornerbacks, like top end NFL cornerbacks, like where you're on an island and you're beating them consistently, that is incredibly impressive and hard to do. And this division is no slouch either. Playing Green Bay and Chicago. Yeah. I know Detroit isn't anything special, but those are two really but good. Detroit teams. is Jeff Akuda. Detroit is Jeff Akuda. Well, he uh, kind of stinks right now, but yeah. Packers yeah, yeah. have Packers have Jair Alexander. Like even even the shitty cornerbacks are better than all the college cornerbacks mm-hmm. you face. So like the fact that you're able to make that transition so seamlessly is incredibly impressive. Like as much as I love Lamb and I love Lamb, 
he is doing it from the slot. And it's just incredibly, it's not incredibly easy, but it's way easier to do it from the slot when you're getting schemed open than to take on press coverage from the alpha role. And like, no, like very, 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 very few people have done it. And you're talking about like Justin Jefferson, like, you know, the Michael Thomases, like the Randy Mosses, like these are the elite, elite, like Anquan Bolden's elite company. So just like there, there, there's no misses there, right? Like, so you're not going to miss by putting your eggs in the basket with Justin Jefferson. Um, I'm so glad because in, in fucking what it do dynasty, I tried to trade Justin Jefferson plus a bunch of shit before the season started to snacks for CEH and got, got straight up rejected. And I'm so happy that happened. It was, it was like Jeff Jefferson. I was offering Jefferson. I was offering like a first, a bunch of stuff. And, and now like, Dude, my wide receivers in that league are insane. You guys are going to be fucked for, like, the next – like. Dude, next mine are, like, ridiculous, but they're on the older side of it. Yeah. I have, like, Allen Robinson. I think I have Stephon yeah. Diggs, Keenan Allen. No, no, I have Stephon Diggs. You don't Theo have Diggs. Diggs. Then yeah. I'll have Adam Thielen, Chark, Boyd. I have, like, all the top guys, but, like, three years older yeah. than your top guys. I have, so, yeah, I have DK Metcalf. Fun. I have AJ Brown. I have Justin Jefferson. I have Terry McLaurin. I have Stephon Diggs. You guys are fucked. You guys are fucked. You're gonna, you're gonna lose. I I, like I, oh, but speaking like of that, dude, I beat I joke. beat Animal this week, and I didn't have a starting running back. I did not. I had two running two running back positions that put up zeros. Come on, Mike. Animal's Animal been through enough this year. I, think I he's beat Animal 13. this week. I just I just have to say it. I had to say it. Animal. I also want to point out one other thing. Talking about Ceh and Justin Jefferson. Remember all off season last year, we we're like, okay, let's figure out what the reason for LSU being so good was, and let's try to. Oh yeah. Out who was bad on this offense? Turns out Joe Brady, Joe Burrow, CEA. Oh, CEH has been decent. Justin Jefferson, probably Jamar Chase is incredible. Maybe it was just Max Moss. Maybe he was the only one that was bad. But like there was no – maybe it was just a collection of really good players and we shouldn't have been trying to discredit every yeah. single player for another guy's success. Like maybe as a bunch they were just all really good and as a dispersed bunch they're still really good football yeah. players. Everyone, everyone was incredible. That's just like – honestly, that's, they're going to go down as the greatest college team ever, ever. I think, in my opinion, even defensively um, too. Yeah, they they were they had it all. They had it all. They had it all. Um, let's talk about this though. Celebration time, dance party. Jonathan Taylor had a first good game of the season. Thirteen carries, ninety-one yards, and added three catches for forty-four yards and a touchdown through the air. I think he basically was open, just ran into, uh, ran a long one in. But I think what gave me a lot of hope is watching him run. He, I don't know about you uh, and what you see on, on tape, but I think. You know, granted, he's facing really shitty run defenses. Right? I, I've said that. I tweeted that, like, before this run started. I'm like, hey, if Jonathan Taylor does nothing for these next three weeks, I'm out on him. Um, but he has been doing stuff. And more importantly, he's looking more decisive. He's making the right cuts. He's making the right reads. He said himself the game is slowing down for him a little bit. So, you know, kind of just that progression coming down. And, and I, I'm a big fan. I've held strong on Jonathan Taylor uh, through thick and thin this year. I've, I've kept him in my top, uh, top 10 dynasty ranks. I, I know you guys have probably moved him down a little bit. And I think this is this is good because even though it's against a bad defense, man, these young young bloods need to build their confidence, right? And mm-hmm. like the whole and time, people are just saying the next few weeks. There's no better matchups than he just played Green Bay, who he did well against Houston. He just did well against the next two are Las Vegas, who Ty Johnson put up like 100 yards against, and then he gets to play Houston again. So I do think yeah. that you know he he did scare me like throughout the entire season. I'm not completely rebought in. I'm not going to put him as high as I had him preseason. I had him as like my dynasty running back three or four. I think I moved mm-hmm. him down to like around 10. I'm not completely fully rebought in just because we've, it's been like an, almost an entire season of disappointment, hot hand approaches. And he was never really the hot hand up until recently, but I do think it's good that he's finally getting his footing underneath yep. them. They're using him out in space a little bit more. He did look good against Houston. I think these next two matchups are just going to help build confidence. And, you know, it's a very similar progression to Miles or Melvin Gordon. Obviously, they had terrible play calling in yep. uh, Los, or San Diego back then. They had terrible play calling. He didn't score a touchdown in his rookie year, and then he came out his second year, and he became the running back that we have come to know and hate. And I think Melvin or Jonathan Taylor is doing a similar thing. He has scored a few touchdowns, but it's just been a really rough go at it. Maybe these Wisconsin running backs are so used to – bad competition with a good offensive line that they're like, okay, maybe I just need to yep. be a good athlete to be good at football. It takes a little bit more than that. And the fact that Indianapolis's offensive line hasn't been as good as we thought it would be kind of hurt him a little bit, but I do like to see the progression, as you said, and there's plenty of Twitter clips this week. It's like, Oh, look, he found the hole when the hole was like the size of two fucking school buses. So like, <laughs> I hope he found it, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's looking up for him, but I'm still hesitant to move him in terms of rookies ahead of Antonio Gibson and ahead of Deandre Swift, because in much worse situations, they've, been much yeah. better on a more consistent basis yeah yeah for sure i mean i understand that i still have him as my guy just 
I mean, whatever. Call me. Yeah, you got to go to the grave with him. He's just. I'm riding. I'm ride or die with Jonathan Taylor. Now that I'm seeing positives, I can't move him now. But Antonio Gibson definitely shot way up as well. Uh, but on the flip side, man, how amazing is the Sean Watson dude against this Colts defense, which has been top end elite all year? Uh, Will Fuller freaking suspended. What does he do? He goes out there and throws 141 yards to Kiki Kuti and 100 yards to Chad Henson. Uh, like this guy NBC, is, Chad Henson, yeah. This guy's freaking incredible, man. He is a dynasty. He's my dynasty uh, QB too. Um, but uh, look, he's he's been incredible, man. I, I, I'm I'm a big big fan. I went a lot all in on Deshaun Watson. I know, like in the league that we're in, the BBB listener league, I was like really trying to hammer us, trying to get him in the, in the back end of the first. So I'm glad that we did. He does still have a really tough schedule, and Kiki Kuti is not going to put up 141 yards every week, but. You know, he's also getting some work on the ground, and I think that's where his fantasy value is going to come. But if you have Deshaun Watson, man, hang on, because this guy is not only a great fantasy quarterback, but I think he's honestly a top-end elite uh, real-life quarterback. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he's throughout his entire career, other than DeAndre Hopkins and, like, a little bit of Wolf Fuller this year, he's had no help. His offensive line has been shitty. He dealt with that injury in his rookie Mm -hmm. year when he was putting up historic numbers, went down early. It's been a tough go in terms of his surrounding cast, but through it all, he's been extremely consistent. This year we saw he had fucking Chad Hansen. He had Kiki QT. Isaiah mm-hmm. Coulter, Twitter's favorite breakout receiver, didn't even go to the game. He was watching on the couch just like us. So he went out there against a top-end defense in a divisional game, and he went toe-to-toe with the Indianapolis Colts. So, yeah, he's my quarterback three in Dynasty, a little bit behind Kyler, but I don't know. It's, it's getting a little iffy. Kyler's not throwing the ball too well for a, for a former baseball player. His accuracy is a little suspect. But, yeah, he's, he's elite in every sense of the word. And if he doesn't get it done with his arm, which he really didn't this game in terms of touchdowns, he'll do it with his legs. I'm pretty sure he scored on the ground. He had like 30-something rushing yards. So he's just extremely consistent no matter who he goes up against, even if it's Indianapolis. So, um, yeah, in terms of other weapons on this team, you got two DJs in the backfield who both stink. And you have Brandon Cooks, who, I mean, I was kind of high on him going into the season just because he's been good his entire career except the year where he suffered two concussions. And we thought he got another one this past week. But He's been very consistent. Just chalk him up for 85 yards, no touchdowns, and like three to four catches a week, and you get a back-end wide receiver too. So I'm pretty high on him in Dynasty because he's a little bit younger than I think people realize. I think he's like 26 or 27. And if he's going to be in the guy in Houston, or at least the 1B because Will Fuller's a free agent after this year, I think he's a sustained value there because Deshaun Watson is a perfect quarterback to throw him open and make big chunk plays with him. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's it's incredible. Like I freaking love Deshaun Watson. He's he's I mean, I'm a fan and I'm rooting for him now just because Billy Bob will be is gone, mm-hmm. um, and it makes it a little bit easier for the team. But he's incredible. Hang on to him. Like that's gonna be like a cornerstone of your dynasty for for years and years to come if he can stay healthy. Next up, Derek Carr, man, bounce back game. Uh, I had to go against him, so that was painful. Um, 381 yards, 200 of which came from Darren Waller, the dynasty tight end, two, three, one, wherever you have him, just freaking incredible man this guy is a beast and just goes back to like off season when i was like dude this guy's such an incredible value and people wanted to fade him because of fucking henry ruggs um and brian edwards so he, this guy is going to be a beast uh down the line for you as well so just just take comfort in that but Derek carr man Derek carr did his thing i think the other thing i want to cover is you know i tweeted this earlier i talked about it on a fleet as well but like this whole week i saw a lot of big names a lot of people come on and say Devonte booker is somehow like some locked in start like rb2 floor and yada yada yada. i was like yo guys like there's a reason why Devonte booker is a fucking backup because he stinks and he stunk his whole career and he's not been good and like you know people started talking about like how he was talented i was like what the fuck are people oh smoking? utah running backs ever been talented yeah, yeah dude like talented what are you guys talking about and this is what happens he goes out gets 16 carries and puts up like eight points or six six point six ppr points which is not what you want to see he got the opportunity but like He's not Josh Jacobs, so don't just plug and play guys because you guys think that, you know, running backs are replaceable. Um, yeah, that's I like, think the big issue, too, is, like, everybody thought it was going to be a workhorse role, which I did as well because that's – I know Josh Jacobs wasn't getting that role, but Jalen Richard has missed some time. I think they just brought on Theo Riddick, and Devontae Booker at least can catch the ball sometimes. So it's like, okay, yeah. he's going to get all the work. It was a three-headed monster where all three heads, both, like, they all just weren't good. And against the Jets' defense, you thought at least it was going to be a positive game script. And they were playing from behind the entire game until Greg Williams is like, you know what I saw in a Madden playbook? <laughs> Engage eight. And we're going to put our slowest guys on Henry Ruggs, who can't catch a pass when somebody's near him. So let's put a slow guy who can't keep up with him. So if they do throw it deep, he'll catch it and beat us. And guess what? That's exactly what they did. Henry Ruggs didn't look good at all the entire game. Yet when you put one-on-one coverage and you can just run by a guy, all you have to do is this, game over. And that's exactly what happened. 
Henry Ruggs to me, I know it's like a breakout game because he had like 80 yards in the game winning touchdown. He is, he looks on the other side of the field and it's like a mirror because he's looking right at Nelson Aguilar and they're the same player. Like he dropped a pass that turned into an interception. He fumbled early in the game. I get it. <laughs> He's really fast. You know who's as fast? Tyson Gay and fucking Usain Bolt. They don't have hands. <laughs> and that's why they're not in the NFL. This guy was picked, what, 12th overall, and he can't do anything? I get it. I get it. I get it. He wasn't good in college. He thought he was going to be good in the NFL because he was high. He has big hands. He can jump high and run fast. I don't know. I, I don't get it. I don't get it, Mike. I know I'm not the biggest analytics guy, but when everybody was saying this guy was going to stink and I watched tape and I'm like, he's not great, I kind of fell into the camp of maybe Henry Ruggs isn't like, that good at football maybe he just snuck his way into Alabama somehow and he ran fast and that's what got him there I don't know I don't know if you've like turned a leaf on this guy I don't know why I'm going on a rant on about fucking Henry Ruggs <laughs> but I just I'm not a believer in his talent and as long as Darren Waller's there he's never going to be the one and once Brian Edwards gets healthy I'm not sure he's gonna be the two yeah I mean look I was never a fan of Henry Ruggs but I, you know he's an interesting he's an interesting prospect because you know if there was an outlier to bet on like maybe he's that guy um, but the fact that he cost a first round pick just meant I never had any shares because I wasn't willing to spend a first round pick on him when I could get guys like T Higgins and LaVisca Chenault in the second. Um, and you know, look, he, he's, he's struggling a little bit. I don't, I don't know if it's all on him. Maybe it's on Gruden. They're not really using him in the short crossing routes, which is like, I feel like that is a strength that he has and they're not really using that way. But at the end of the other, other than the spectrum, you got to earn your targets and he's not really doing that. And he's not really separating himself from the Nelson Aguilar's of the world or the Hunter Renfro's of the world. The only one separating himself is freaking Darren Waller who's a beast. Um, so there's not much to, to go on there. I will say on the flip side of the ball though, Denzel Mims, man, if you, if you can flip Henry Ruggs for Denzel Mims, I would do that immediately because Denzel Mims has shown some stuff, um, shown some of the stuff for why we liked him. Uh, I think I did this right up in the BDG guide. And, you know, he does, he does remind me a little bit of a, of a Marvin Jones, like a more athletic Marvin Jones. And he, he's kind of showing what he can do under Gase. And we know the Adam Gase effect and the discount that you have to apply to players under him and just his play calling is brutal. And look, freaking Greg Williams got fired. Praise the Lord. Um, I think, you know, I think this means Adam Gase is going to get fired. It reminds me of a time where like, like uh, a company I used to work for, like my boss, like they got him to like, basically can a bunch of people and they can him after <laughs> like i feel like i feel like this is kind of going down that path but like hey adam like we got your back like you make sure you just just go and just go and let, let these guys go and we'll let you rebuild like yeah, man. sam it. darnold's just in the line of fire too he's like man i'm just a body here and you're just shooting me dead <laughs> like this is yeah. crazy I think, I think, I hope, I hope, and I think they're going to fire Adam Gase. And if they release this team from Adam Gase, they're going to get Trevor Lawrence next next year. With Trevor Lawrence plus Denzel Mims plus a couple O line plus Brashad Perriman, I think it can be a pretty pretty decent offense. I think it's a great, great, great buy. I love Denzel Mims, but the Twitter hype chamber is also on Denzel Mims, so it might be tough to get him from like the sharp, more sharper people. But if you're in your like home dynasty leagues, he has not been doing much on the number side. But if you look at the peripherals the air yards and opportunities he's getting and what he's been able to do uh, on the, while he's on the field, it is definitely some bright spots there. So I would definitely be buying in on someone like Denzel Mims. Uh, yeah. You don't have um, to tell Adam Gase about the peripherals. That guy's eyes are going everywhere. <laughs> I think that brings us to the Seattle and Giants game. Dude, Nothing are, to talk about. They fucking stink. Are the Seahawks the biggest frauds in the NFL? Like their defense stinks. We know that Jamal Adams thinks he's the best safety in the league because he runs free off the edge every play. This offense is no longer cooking. DK Metcalf is the only one out there doing anything. Tyler Lockett has turned into the abstinent version of Jameson Crowder. Like he's going out there and putting up like 40, 50 receiving yards, a touchdown every 17 weeks. Like this offense isn't great. Chris Carson isn't a hundred percent. He just says he's not a hundred percent, puts up like 80 yards and goes home. Carlos Hyde is for some reason still touching the ball. Rashad Penny is supposed to be back this week. I don't know. The fact that you couldn't, I know the Giants have a good defense, but the fact that an offense that used to be of the caliber of a Green Bay or a Kansas City earlier in the year, can't put up what was it like 17 13 or something like that 17 12 yeah you can't put up more than 12 points and i think they got a safety as well like two of your points were off a safety like i don't know i russell wilson is tough for me in dynasty because it seems like every year it's either the first half or the second half it's just a completely different story i remember that one year with doug baldwin he sucked the entire first half of the year and then doug baldwin and him just combined for like 18 touchdowns in four weeks this year it's the flip-flop it's beginning the season they were great Second half of the season, they're falling apart. The only consistent piece here is DK Metcalf absolutely babying any cornerback that wants to face him. I wish I wish I'd known that before I traded for him in Philly. But yeah, he's been thoroughly, thoroughly disappointing. Um, you know, I really hope he bounces back. But I mean, I think it's just it 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 speaks volumes when you lose 
to the New York Giants and their backup quarterback, Colt McCoy, puts up 100 yards, one TD, and an interception. Well, it's because you got Wayne Gallman, who's better than the former second overall pick, Saquon Barkley. Like, Wayne Gallman is going out there and scoring <laughs> yeah. 100 yards every single week. Yeah, but it's just embarrassing. I mean, Pete Carroll just totally, totally overrated coach. Brian Schottenheimer, not the greatest play caller uh, in the NFL, obviously, but – it's disappointing, man. It's disappointing to see them get held back. Like the Seattle and Steelers, nobody plays down to competition like these two teams. Oh my gosh! Nobody the plays. The spread down. for both of these games is double digits. Like, I actually did bet on the Seahawks. I bet on the Pittsburgh Steelers. I bet on the Washington Football Team because no matter who Pittsburgh plays, they'll keep it within seven until it's the end of the game, and that came to bite them in the ass. Seattle, like, I don't know if I can trust them with a fucking spread bigger than seven. Like, these <laughs> yeah. guys cannot keep people off the field. And even if they're trying to keep them off the field, they'll let them right back in and backdoor you. So, yeah, yeah. a little gambling talk from a guy who never wins bets. Yeah, don't bet on the Seahawks because they will not cover the spread for you. Yeah, I, I bet against the Seahawks against Philly last week, and I hail Mary save me. And then this week, I just stayed <laughs> <laughs> uh, Next up, dude, some, some more excitement. Uh, Rams versus Cardinals. Not exciting for Kyler Murray and his squad where they're just looking like regression. I don't know if you guys seen the DeAndre Hopkins route chart, but it's basically all in like the right corner. And it looks like, honestly, I, I tweeted that like they could have used David Johnson for that. Uh, just like, just, yeah, like, just straight up, the middle. Like, <laughs> yeah. Straight up, like in the middle to the left, like no deep routes. Like, I don't know what they're doing there. They got to fix that. DeAndre Hopkins is way too good to not get used like that. But on the flip side of the ball, man, Cam Akers, 21 touches on the ground, 21 carries on the ground, one target, still inexplicable. The fact that he's not getting the opportunity on the receiving end, but you know, he kind of took over the backfield, man. 21 carries to Darrell Henderson, three, Jared Goff at four, Malcolm Brown finally getting phased out here a little bit. Um, I mean, what do you, what do you see, man? What do you, what are you doing about Cam Akers? Like I'm excited. I still don't think he's, he's too reliable this season just because he's not getting that receiving work. And like, just knowing Sean McVay can easily flip the script and go back to Malcolm Brown next week in a, in a more negative game script. I don't feel too comfortable starting acres. Um, but you know, he is showing some of the flashes of what we've seen in college and what he is, is like, you know, I comp him to Joe Mixon. I think that's really like similar to what he is. He's not as good of a receiver, not as good of a prospect that Joe Mixon was, but very athletic uh, tackle breaking machine that you need to get into space. But I'm excited to see at least him getting the opportunity. Yeah. I, I think it was really important to see the opportunity and the workload he got this game because it's a divisional game. It's really important for your divisional record, especially in the NFC West when it's so competitive. The fact that Daryl Henderson went down with an injury early on and they didn't just give it to Malcolm Brown every carry because Sean McVay seems to trust him with his life and every deep, dark secret he's ever had. The fact that they gave Cam Akers 21 touches and Malcolm Brown played the least amount of snaps he's played this entire season with just 16% of the offensive snaps shows me that they're finally putting a little bit of trust in Cam Akers and we got to remember, to start the season, he was the lead back. I think it was week two or week three, right in the beginning of the game. He had a handful of carries, got hurt, missed an extended period of time. And in those first few weeks, he didn't look good at all. He was reminiscent of Jonathan Taylor and Trent Richardson. And then he comes back, and he looks a whole lot better. He breaks some big plays. I think he had like nine rushes for 84 yards last week. And then he had another big run a few weeks back. This week, the efficiency wasn't there, but they used him inside the five, inside the 10 a whole lot. And they just pounded the rock with him to end the game, basically run out the clock. So I do like the fact that they leaned on him heavily because this is a team that wants to run the ball. Daryl Henderson came in at the end of the game and break, broke off a big run. But the fact that he got 21 touches in a game this important, when they were able to move the ball through the air decently well, like Cooper Cup had a good game, Robert Woods, who just turns into Michael Thomas after the bye. Uh, the fact that they leaned on Cam Akers so heavily shows me that they are starting to build a little bit of confidence in him. I have no doubt that next year he's going to be the lead back because I think he's much more talented than Daryl Henderson. Obviously, rest of season, he's more of a back-end RB2 just because of the lack of certainty of Sean McVay's play calling. But it was good to see, and it's good to see that he's becoming a better running back as the season progresses like we saw with Jonathan Taylor. And I think it's a little bit more impressive than Taylor because he did miss a chunk of time in the middle of the season, comes back and looks like a completely different guy. Yeah, definitely, definitely some positive signs there. Um, that's pretty much all I wanted to cover uh, on that on that game because I want to get to the main event here. Um, Patriots, uh, my Patriots, led by Cam Newton. Uh, led is led is generous because he he passed for sixty nine yards, um, which is hella nice. Says, but, yeah, yeah sixty nine yards, uh, but he did rush for two touchdowns. Why Cam is Cam was a baller for fantasy purposes. But yeah, we beat you forty five to nothing. Uh, I'm not surprised mainly because Belichick 
always dissects rookie quarterbacks. It doesn't matter who you are. The only one that's like kind of made us look foolish is Deshaun Watson. Even then, we still won the game, but Deshaun Watson's like really the only one that can like pick apart our defense. Um, but Justin Herbert got completely shut down. Um, the entire the entire offense got shut down. He got shut out. It's hard to get shut out in an NFL game uh, because there's field. It's really easy when Anthony Lynn's your coach. It's it's yeah. actually very easy when Anthony Lynn is your coach. <laughs> yeah, but, but Anthony Lynn is is making the Anthony Lynn plus Michael Badgley tag team is making a donut in NFL the new thing because you know it's it honestly it is really 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 hard to do. Um, but yeah, I, mean, I don't know what what did you what did you think about this game? I think you know what I thought about this game, but I'll just I'll try to explain what happened Sunday. I saw something that the Patriots punted four times, and the amount of men the Chargers fielded on those punts were 12, 10, 10, and eleven. They can't even count. So it's good they put up zero because they know how many points they had because they can't count past that number. It was absolutely – it was – I can't even say the fucking word absolutely. It was ridiculous. It was terrible. I wanted Justin Herbert to get benched not because he was bad but because I wanted him to not die on the field. Their left tackle missed the game because of the birth of his third child. Not the first. I'd understand that, right? Not the second. The third. You've seen this happen twice. And I'm not saying, like, you can't be a family man, but – yeah, your franchise quarterback back there. I mean, he's gonna be paying your bills for those kids. So I'm not I'm not saying don't go to your kid's birth, but like when you're facing Bill Belichick, you know he's gonna be coming off the edge, and you know Justin Herbert's got a 50-50 chance of walking out of that field with half a leg. So I would have preferred him to be there. The left tackle is basically a turnstile all game. That was disgusting. Justin Herbert got hit low a million times, but it didn't really matter. It, it was terrible. They had Stefan Gilmore traveling with Keenan Allen, which brought a tear to my eye because I knew his day was over. Austin <laughs> Eckler decent on the ground but they also force fed him like nine targets and he caught like three of them it was it was a tough go at it I didn't see much of Justin or Joshua Kelly which put like a little bit of a smile on my face but (laughs) I mean overall there's not much to say when Sony Michelle has a good game against you you know you're basically dead to rights and Sony Michelle had a pretty good game against them I think he even caught a pass which he hasn't done since Georgia so it's there's not much to say here you score zero points it was a terrible game the pressure was all over him Bill Belichick turned Justin Herbert into Tyrod Taylor and I kind of wish Anthony Lynn turned to Tyrod Taylor so our franchise guy wouldn't get hurt but he made it out of there alive and I'm happy about that he goes up against the Falcons this week who are a little bit rejuvenated I just hope he can have some semblance of confidence that the five guys in front of him won't just fall to the ground when they snap the ball and I hope to God Keenan Allen just gets open over the middle because I'm a little bit worried that all he does is rely on Keenan Allen and when there's a good cornerback on him he struggles a little bit we saw with Stephon Gilmore and against Tredavious White, the only time Keenan Allen scored was when he motioned across the formation and he caught a pass on a linebacker. So hopefully he does build some confidence with Mike Williams, but I, I don't blame the kid. I wouldn't be confident in Mike Williams either because, as you said, he gets chokes land and dies on the field every single time he catches the ball. But, yeah, to say the least, it wasn't a great game. It wasn't a good game at all. Anytime you can put up this many points, I mean, there's not much to talk about. I'm not as sad as last week because I feel like last week there was a chance to win this game. This one, I mean, from the time – I'll put it this way. If you didn't bet on this game and bet on the New England Patriots by just looking at who the two coaches are, then I'm not sure you understand football because there was not (laughs) a chance in hell the Patriots would keep this within 25 points. The Chargers were going to put up a donut whether you liked it or not. And I was – I snuffed – I don't know. I I sniffed that out like two weeks ago. I'm just happy that my team is – I might get to watch my team in the playoffs led by Cam Newton. Uh, It's just interesting to see, like, in this day and age, to have a quarterback pass for sub-100 yards and and beat the other team 45 to nothing is true – it's true dominance. Uh, it, you know, it, it, I mean, yeah, this I felt is, dominated this, Sunday, Mike. I was, this is, I was this is the stuff day. that BDSM victims dream of, you know, just get dominated this hard. And, you know, Noah and his team played that role for us in the, uh, this weekend, and it was great to see. But let's move on to the next game. Chargers, uh, sorry, not Chargers, the Denver Broncos. Don't do that to me, Mike. Don't give me that PTSD. <laughs> Denver Broncos versus the Kansas City Chiefs. The Broncos' defense uh, somehow kept Patrick Mahomes relatively in line and the entire Chiefs' offense relatively in line. Uh, CH obviously missed the game. I actually started him in a couple of leagues, put up a donut for me, which was painful because I didn't have time to swap him out. Yeah, we both but, had a donut this week, Mike. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but I think the more interesting thing here is to just, it's just to highlight you know, Drew Locke stinks, right? Like we talked about him in the off season and, you know, there was that one guy who was always big mad about him in the YouTube comments every time. We yeah, it was Drew Locke. Locke. He's his only yeah, fan. Drew, Drew Locke's burner. 
he's just not very good. I mean, he's not seeing the field. He's not making the right decisions, in my opinion. Um, Melvin Gordon had himself a game, but I wouldn't get too excited. I mean, on the receiving end, though, like Noah Fant led the team with four receptions for 57 yards, and you have to scroll all the way down past past KJ Hamler, past Tim Patrick, past Tyree Cleveland, past Melvin Gordon, past Nick Van Nett to find generational talent, Jerry Judy, with one reception for five yards. What are you doing with Judy? How worried are you uh, with, when it comes to him and just, just having Drew Locke as his quarterback, knowing that next year the better and superior receiver, in my opinion, Cortland Sutton, is coming back? Like, what, what are we doing with Jerry Judy these days? I think this all comes down to quarterback play. I do think Jerry Judy is still talented. You don't, despite what I said about Henry Ruggs, you don't make it to Alabama and then put up the numbers he did that Ruggs didn't and not be a talented receiver. I do think that he is still extremely talented. It's hard to produce consistently or produce at all when you have Drew Locke throwing you the ball. Now, Tim Patrick, like a 28-year-old third-year receiver somehow, I don't know how that math works out, that he's this old at that point of his career is doing extremely well, who I do think is going to make himself some money this offseason. I don't get it, but I'm not losing hope. Obviously, guys like Brandon Ayuk are jumping him. Guys like Chase Claypool have more than jumped him. And obviously, the guys we talked about earlier, C.D. Lamb, uh, even Jalen Rager is ahead of him. It's, it's tough to have confidence in him because these past few years, we've seen so many rookies do it. In, in the face of terrible quarterback play, like A.J. Brown, I think in his first game ever with Marcus Mariota, had 100 yards. Jared Judy did put up a 100-yard game this year. I think it was against Atlanta, and I think Drew Locke was the quarterback. So he has shown something. It's just – it's tough, as you said, because Noah Fant is establishing himself. Obviously, Cortland Sutton next year back from his ACL is going to be a really good receiver and probably – well, definitely the 1A at least on this team. So unless they get a quarterback that can distribute the ball well enough to support three mouths, I think he's going to be the one left out in that rotation. So – Hopefully they change their offensive scheme for his sake to throw the ball more and get a guy that can throw the ball. But as it looks right now, I mean, I can't name how many, but I'd say there's probably seven or eight rookie receivers ahead of him from this class alone. And with the yeah. influx of rookies coming in next year, he's just going to continue to move further and further down my rankings. Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally agree with you. I think if you can flip Jerry Judy for a first, I would do it and just reset the clock. And 100%. Would time. you take Denzel Mims or Jerry Judy? I would take Denzel Mims plus the profit. You know, I think you could get mm-hmm. I think you get Denzel Mims plus a second for Jerry Judy, and I would take that over Jerry Judy. I think uh, straight up they're super close. If you can get anything on top, I'd I'd be happy with that. Because you know one mm-hmm. of them is gonna have Trevor Lawrence. You know the other one has like a 50-50 chance of having Drew Locke. So yeah. Bet on that. Exactly. Um on the flip side of the ball, there isn't too much to talk about here, but I do want to talk, cover Travis Kelsey league winner. Mm-hmm. Uh he is he's a freaking stud. Like what he's been doing. You know, first tight end to have five straight 1,000-yard seasons. The season isn't even over yet. He has a mint, 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 mint schedule coming up in the playoffs. I made a couple moves for him in Dynasty and tight end premium leagues. I have a league with Darren Waller and Travis Kelsey. I got 80 points. I saw that picture. You had like 80 points between them. I still might lose that league because I had to to face Kasicki and Logan Thomas and like Derek Carr, and he had like a bunch of other random people blow up. So it's like I think we're at like – he has like 240 points, and I'm like 232 right now, and I have like Lamar and his Zeke, so – I have a chance to win, but like it's just an insane, insane scoring week. Um, that league I just run so bad. I have like I have the most points for the second closest is like 150 points. The third closest is like 400 points away, and I'm like barely scraping for a playoff spot. <laughs> it's freaking the tilting. fantasy football. You can be the best team and the worst yeah, team at the same it's time. It's freaking tilting. Uh, but yeah, just like Travis Kelsey, what 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 is your thought for Dynasty? I tweeted this out earlier. I think I made a huge mistake by ranking Andrews ahead of him, like a little bit prematurely, just because like. You know, Andrews, I, I bought into the youth. I bought into the production. Obviously, the offense took a step back. But, like, the advantage, the scoring advantage that Travis Kelsey is giving you and tight ends, the fact that tight ends last way longer than wide receivers, they can last well into their mid-30s, uh, sometimes higher 30s if you look at the Super League guys, which Travis Kelsey obviously is. And I think that advantage that you're getting with Mahomes is just too much to pass up. Like, you're basically getting a top-end wide receiver with, like, almost like a running back floor in the tight end in the tight end slot. It's just invaluable, invaluable. Like, where, yeah, where do you have – The way I think about it, too, is, Travis like, Kelsey. when you think of the elite tight ends we've seen recently, obviously Rob Gronkowski, obviously Jimmy Graham, but even lesser guys like Delaney Walker and Greg Olson, they kind of fell apart in their early 30s. But you have to realize these guys, Greg Olson had foot injuries. I know he, like, played a bunch of years in a row and he set some streaks and then he suffered a foot injury, kind of ruined him. Gronk was banged up throughout his entire career. Delaney Walker, I think he like hurt either. He like broke his ankle, then his foot, then his back or something. <clears throat> Jimmy Graham, I'm not sure if he had like a major injury that I'm forgetting, but he's also like 6'7", and he's missed the game throughout his career. The thing about Travis Kelsey is 
I can't remember a time over the last six, seven years where he's missed a game, suffered any sort of injury. He's 31, sure, but he's not the most athletic guy. He's not like Delaney Walker. He, not Delaney Walker, uh, Darren Waller. He's a good receiving tight end, but he also relies a lot on athleticism, whereas Travis Kelsey isn't relying on burning guys. He's not relying on mossing yeah. people. He just gets open. He's a really, really smart, good football player, and I think – Honestly, he deserves to be in the conversation of a guy like Tony Gonzalez, who played until he was 37, putting up 900-yard seasons. I don't think it's brash to say this guy legitimately, if he stays healthy, which is a big if, but, I mean, there's nothing to suggest he would get hurt or he's injury-prone. I I don't think it's brash to say for the next five, six years, he's going to be tight end one or tight end two overall. And the fact that he has that window of production and that elite production where he's putting up you know, a thousand yards on a year in year out basis, 80 yards like clockwork. And you have Patrick Mahomes on your team. And despite Terry kill becoming as good of a receiver as he is, the fact that Kelsey still has the role that he has just tells me that he deserves to be the tight end one or two in dynasty. Obviously Kittle has a, he's a lot younger, but Kittle has also been very banged up throughout his entire career. Maybe he goes down the path of a Gronk. Mm-hmm. I hope not. But maybe his career ends at 30, 31, and Kelsey's playing until he's 36, 37, and they have the same window of production. So I don't think it's crazy to have him as your tight end one despite the age. Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a great point, right? Like Kansas City Chiefs use Kelsey as, you know, primarily a move tight end. Like he's never been a top end blocker, and Kittle is very, very involved in the run game. If you compare, like Kittle's way more comparable to Rob Gronkowski than, than you know, Travis Kelsey, right? Like they're both heavily, heavily involved in the run game. And a, and a big piece of blocking, which is, you know, great for good real football for fantasy purposes, unless you, I don't play any points for block league, so that's not great. Point for um, pancake, triple P. Yeah, point for pancake. And like you said, he's not been the the model citizen of health. So if you have to rank Travis Kelsey ahead of George Kittle, you know, go for I saw Kittle, number one, for now. We're kind of going to see what happens next year because they're both kind of elite. But, man, Travis Kelsey, total freaking stud. I'm glad I traded for him in a couple leagues. If I win, it's definitely going to be because of him in tight end premium formats. Um, next game, talk about – Steelers, Washington, we talked about how, how Steelers played down to their competition. None more so than here. They look like, they look like bums uh, for the majority of the game. I mean, you know, James Washington led the, led the team with 80 yards and a touchdown, dropped a long bomb there. Deontay Johnson continues to get massive targets, but not very efficient with them. Um, Juju Smith-Schuster, even less efficient this game than he was. But I think, you know, the one takeaway here is Antonio Gibson, man. Antonio Gibson, looking like turf toe. Uh, you know, he had a great run, stiff arm some guy, and then came off the field and just basically never went back in. Turf toe, if you guys remember, Deontay Adams had it last year. Um, you know, in the serious side, you can miss a few weeks. On the lighter side, you're still missing a couple of weeks and not going to be effective when you come back. So it really sucks because – I want to see what he's going to do for this playoff run and see like what a full season of Antonio Gibson look like. Doesn't look like we're going to get that, um, unfortunately. But you know, dynasty wise, his value hasn't changed. I think he's proven enough to show me that he's going to be a top end guy um, for me, a top five uh, rookie running back, and probably and a top ten dynasty running back as well. Um, but yeah, man, you just hate to see the injuries. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if he just sits out the rest of the year. I know they're in playoff contention, so maybe if they do make the playoffs, he shows back up and we can throw those however many games are in there to the end of his regular season numbers and look at it. But with Washington's medical staff, you never know how long it's going to take to come back. But as you said, he's well within my top 10 overall running backs in Dynasty. I, as I said, I think he's my running back two from this class behind DeAndre Swift. He's fantastic. And the fact that he's doing what he's doing right now, despite never playing running back full-time until this season. And I know it's like not – it's not high praise to say, oh, he beat up Peyton Barber. He beat out J.D. McKissick. But there were two NFL running backs ahead of him on the depth chart or at least like competing with him for the number one job, and he beat them out, and he held them off for a good portion of the season. So he's extremely talented. As he said, on the other side of the ball, Deontay Johnson is like really good and really bad because he yeah. gets like so many targets, and he drops so many of them. And Mike Tomlin actually said, you know, if these guys can't catch passes, we'll find people that can. I'm not sure where you're going to find them from because even like Eric Ebron is dropping passes. I mean, maybe you play Chase Claypool more than 50% of the snaps. Maybe that's an idea because this guy's an absolute monster. But um, as far as his dynasty value goes, I think not that I think people are getting too high on him because of this season, but for what he's done with the opportunities he's been given, I'm not sure he deserves to be ranked as highly as many people think he should be ranked because no matter what happens, it seems like the Steelers are always going to add a receiver in the draft. Like Juju Smith-Schuster was the guy, and then they add Deontay Johnson, and then they add Chase Claypool, and they've added James Washington in the past. So 
I'm not sure. I'm not saying like don't buy into Deontay Johnson. I think he's a good receiver. I'm just not sure he should be mentioned in like a high end wide receiver two conversation just because he's young and because he's getting targets right now. The fact that he's not doing a whole lot with them other than a few games here and there. Um, I'd, I'd much rather have Chase Claypool because I think he has more staying power and he's a better overall receiver than Deontay. Yeah, I have him as a wide receiver three. I think I have him like wide receiver 28 or something like that. But again, just like a big block of players. Um, but yeah, I mean, not not great. I mean, you know, people always talked about how like they've been shitting on Steelers about that they're like the worst 11 and 0 team uh, ever. And, you know, they kind of showed a little bit of it right there. But yeah, enough about that. Let's move on to the more exciting game. I think Josh Allen. Want, like uh, Philly and Green Bay. If we want to talk about Jalen Hurts finally. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's talk about quickly about that. I mean, Jalen Hurts went out there, did not look great as a passer, but he did add some excitement on the ground. Um, it'll be interesting to see what they do now with a full week of prep and a full uh, full game of starting. I still think, like, if he hits, it'll be, it'll be like, he'll be overcoming the odds because – I'm not sure if he is exactly a starting caliber, but what I what I am certain of is he's better than Carson Wentz is right now. Because Carson Wentz, whatever it is, I tweeted today, like I don't think we've ever seen a fall off this dramatic at this stage in his career. Like he he's 27 years old. He should be in his absolute prime and like peak production. And he went straight up from like MVP candidate to like runaway MVP favorite two years ago to like stone worst quarterback in the league. Um, you think it had I've to never... do with his ACL injury. The year that he was on his MVP like tour. I think it was against the Seahawks. He tore his ACL. And ever since then, he's just been in, not injury prone, but he's been, well, I guess injury prone as well as back, but he's had bad footwork. I saw that Brett Coleman video. He's like, yeah, his footwork is just completely bad. His front foot is not pointing towards his receiver. Maybe that had to do with it because he still does have a pretty big arm, but I don't know. Like he's under throwing receivers. He's overthrowing receivers. He's just, he's not he's accurate. Bad. He, I, I don't know. He was so good when he was younger because he was extending plays and making great throws and escaping all the pressure. Now there's pressure in his face, and it seems like he just sits there and waits for it to get to him. So he's an abomination. He's getting paid to do nothing, which is kind of the dream. Jalen Hurts, I guess we'll see. Well, it remains to be seen if he's a good NFL quarterback. As you said, he didn't look great throwing the ball, but the fact that he can add it on add points on the ground by running for fantasy, I wouldn't be too opposed to adding him. I think they play the Saints this week, who are a pretty good defense. But yeah. they are a pass funnel. They're not going to be able to run a whole lot. Miles Sanders hasn't looked all that great as of late, even out of the backfield receiving. So they're probably going to have to drop back and throw a little bit because this isn't a team that you can just uh, punch the ball up the middle 40 times and somebody just score. Or are you just stretching? No, I'm just stretching. Oh, I thought you got pumped up for something. Um, yeah, this, uh, the Saints aren't a team that you can have the luxury of just trying to run out the clock on because that's what they're going to do to you. So it'll probably be forced to throw, and we'll get to see what Jalen Hurts really is because they do have some decent weapons there. I know they're using Alshon Jeffrey more than Fulgham, which is terrible. But, you know, this this Philadelphia team, this is a completely lost season. The fact that the Giants and the the Redskins, the Washington football team, are ahead of them is – it's a joke. And on the other side of the ball, Green Bay, they continue to throw on the one-yard line. But A.J. Uh, Aaron Jones is like, you know what, I'll just run it for 77 yards if you're not going <laughs> to give me a goal line carry. So he's, so he's like, studs. not getting used as much as I hope he would be. But, yeah, this team, Devontae Adams and Aaron Jones are both – elite players as you all studs know. will be studs guys studs will be studs start them comfortably but yeah the, i want to go josh allen you know we talked about how how he's a tough stretch of defenses and he went out there and balled out against the san francisco 49ers making you feel a little bit more comfortable about putting him in your lineup went up for four touchdowns 375 yards he looked he looked good i mean cole beasley led the team cole beasley has been sneaky sneaky good this year Cole Beasley's uh, on pace for like 1100 yards and eight touchdowns this year yeah yeah, he's having like a Julian Edelman esque year. I actually have him on a few teams. Just had him as like a as like a depth play, and he's been he's been outstanding, um, and leading the team, just doing doing crazy things, man. I mean, with John Brown out, it seems like you know Josh Allen's kind of relying on him. Stephon Diggs balls out, you know, ten reception, ninety two yards. Didn't get a touchdown, but like he's getting the volume of a true alpha wide receiver. He's like younger Keenan point. Allen, I moved him up to my wide receiver nine in Dynasty because. Yeah. I mean, Josh Allen has looked incredible this year. Stephon yeah. Diggs has looked incredible his entire career. And now he's the solidified number one in an offense, seeing 10 targets basically every single game. There's not much more you can ask for for him. Yeah, he should he should be in your top 12 for sure. Um, on the flip side of the ball, Brandon Ayuk has moved a lot up in my rankings. He's been really good. I want to see what he looked like with Debo. I still want to see what they look like with George Kittle. 
mm-hmm. and to see where that volume is. But Brandon Ayuk has been really good. I'm taking that fat L because I, I laughed at people saying that he was better than uh, Nikhil Harry when in reality he's, he's way better. He's not only better. I think but, you're better than Nikhil Harry too. So don't yeah, I think I think we're probably better than Nikhil Harry. But Brandon Ayuk has been really really good. It's always tough to evaluate those like later breakout guys that come from JUCOs, which is why I had him higher than Michael Pittman, but nowhere near high enough. Uh, he's kind of proving to be that like alpha wide receiver one, just another, another guy to add to an incredible, incredible rookie wide receiver class. Honestly, best of all time. Uh, I can say that now with, with like pretty confidently just based on what they've been able to do. But yeah, he's been exciting. Debo continues to get his moves and his negative air yard targets behind the line. So they kind of serve a little bit different purposes. Ayuk also, Ayuk and Debo both tend to get carries. Um, but I mean, Tevin Coleman, hilarious stat line, uh, just he's always been bad but two carries for negative 11 yards negative five and a half yards per carry which is just i thought was pretty comical um but yeah i mean buffalo pulls out a huge win i mean they're they're look like a real team the only thing they're missing is a real run game because their run game stinks um that class fumbled like yeah. twice one got overturned then he yeah. came back and fumbled right after <laughs> yeah he yes. lost he fumbled away his job to devin singletary who was also just not good I mean, this run game is not good. If, if if they had a legit run game, like maybe they could be a decent team because their defense just really isn't good enough to carry. I don't. I'm I'm interested to see how far they go in the playoffs. But Josh Allen is definitely playing at an MVP esque level. So you know, great great for him. I know you guys have him in play the play the public, I believe. Um, so just a great pickup there. I mean, he's gonna be he's a top ten dynasty quarterback. I would. Here's a good question: Who would you rather have? How many quarterbacks do you have ahead of Josh Allen, including the 2021 class? I have four quarterbacks ahead of him. He's, he's my QB five. five. Yeah. Wow. Okay. He's so only behind uh, all bias aside, he's behind Patrick Mahomes, Kyler Murray, Deshaun Watson, Justin Herbert, and then him. I mean, I was looking at it right, and just like from an objective point of view, he's twenty four. This mm-hmm. season, he's on pace for forty five hundred yards, thirty five touchdowns, and on the ground, another eight touchdown pace. And throughout his three years in the league, he has shown steady progression and like a big jump up this year in terms of accuracy and completion percentage, touchdown rate, his interception rates going down. He is still heavily involved in the run game on the goal line. Like he's a legit dual threat quarterback. That's super young that at this point, which I like to see, and it's kind of underrated. They've found what works for him. They're just building their yep. offense around guys who get open quickly, whether it's Diggs, Cole Beasley, John Brown, people other than Diggs, like Cole Beasley and John Brown aren't hurting your pockets a lot. They get open quick, and he has a rifle arm that's going to be able to find them. So I think they have found the solution to what Josh Allen is. It's not these big body receivers like they try to do in Carolina and they try to do with Josh Allen early on. It's these shorter guys that get open really quick, either underneath or deep down the field. And he has been a completely different quarterback from year one to year three, just skipping year two. He has made a jump that I don't know. Obviously, there's other guys that have done really well, but like I don't know if I've seen somebody progress as a passer as much as Josh Allen has. I have not. Coming into the league, people were saying, like, this guy isn't a quarterback. He went to Wyoming, and he just threw it over the mountains there. But now he comes in, and he's extremely accurate in some bad weather games in Buffalo, and he is on pace to be probably, like, third or fourth in the MVP race and be extremely consistent throughout the season. I don't know. I just I, – I have a lot of confidence in him. Obviously, Trevor Lawrence is extremely talented, and Justin Fields, it remains to be seen if he's going to go number two overall and who number two the number two pick is. They'd be enticing, but just seeing what Josh Allen has done at the age of 24, like, I'll, I'll take him over those guys as well. Yeah, it's been incredibly impressive what both the Bills and Miami Dolphins, who were the laughing stock of the NFL, how they've gone about building their teams. And specifically the Bills, and like you said, how they've built around Josh Allen. They don't ask him to do things that he's not good at doing. And they're building a team around him, like guys that get open to Stephon Diggs and get open against any any defensive back in the league. Um, and you got Cole Beasley out of the slot, just like a lot of these quick hitters. They're missing John Brown, because I think John Brown's a big part of that offense. He is that deep deep ball guy. But what Josh Allen's been able to do, I have not seen this type of progression ever in the NFL, but I'm, I'm so young. So maybe there's someone back in like the black and white TV days that did it. I doubt it because those guys were barely throwing passes. But I think, you know, what he's shown his progression has been incredibly, incredibly impressive. I don't have him that high yet, but I can totally see the case for him. You know, if there's a decision to be made between Josh Allen and T- Trevor Lawrence, I'm still taking Trevor Lawrence more often than not. Unless like, Maybe if you're like a top end contender, right? And you and you know that you need Josh unless Adam Gase is still there, then I think that yeah, would push yeah. unless yeah, unless Adam Gase is still there, then we'll we'll rediscuss. Um, but yeah, he's definitely a top eight 
at a minimum. And, you know, if you have him above Russell Wilson, I can't blame you. I still have Russell Wilson ahead of Josh Allen, but it, he's in that discussion. I think what he's just been incredibly, incredibly impressive. All right. So that's all we got for the games. Um, I don't know if you have anything else you wanted to cover. Nope. I think uh, this is like over an hour already. So yeah, that was a long one. So we're going to book that one and uh, shelf it and edit it and get it out to you guys. And yeah, I mean, if you guys enjoyed again, just make sure you hit the thumbs up, hit the subscribe button and tune in every week because make sure you subscribe to the main bunk bed breakdowns channel. In addition to the BGG channel, because we are just pumping, pumping out content, pumping out content every week, uh, almost every day. Um, yeah, basically almost every day. Now you're going to get content from us on the channel. And as these playoffs come to a close and championships are won, Remember that Dynasty never sleeps, and we're going to keep putting out off-season Dynasty content so you guys know what to look out for in your rookie drafts come next year. And I'm excited because we're going to be opening up BDG leagues again. Uh, so that's something that's You can be excited, excited, Mike. That's a fucking pain in the ass, but I love it because you guys get more involved in Dynasty. Yeah. And I think last year we had 150. 140-something, 147 or something like that. Yeah, something ridiculous. Yeah. So yeah. it does take a lot of time to set those up, but once you guys are in there and you're drafting – I promise you, you will never go back to loving redraft the same way you used to because yeah. Dynasty is a whole new animal. Yeah. It's a it's it's a different animal, and it's one that Mike and I both love. Yeah, Noah will be grinding the leagues. I'll be grinding the ADPs, um, as you know. So it'll be an exciting time. So make sure you stay tuned for that and just tune in the channel. All right, that's all we got for you guys. Peace. Peace.